Okay, I guess it's time to start. Um, my name is Chris Tankersley. Thank you for coming to my talk, Don't Trust Your Users. Um, a little bit of house cleaning uh, right up front. Uh, like I said, my name is Chris Tankersley. I've been doing PHP for about 10 years. Um, I have a lot of projects up on GitHub which are kind of out of date, um, but if you're interested, you can go take a look. The last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of Symfony 2 and Drupal development. Um, so my open source stuff has lagged behind a little bit because I've been doing a lot of client work. Um, but to know a little bit more about me, I never graduated college. I actually went to a local community college um, that was kind of in the transition from being an old style technical college to uh, associate's college and then eventually they're going to turn into a four-year degree. But you could really see how everything was structured there. When you went in and signed up for classes, I did computer programming, you just took a huge massive amount of languages. So the vast majority of my degree was taking things like COBOL and RPG because we have a lot of factories, C++, uh, C Sharp, VB.net, um, and then some very basic classes. But probably the best thing I got out of it was my programming teacher, Von Plessner. He taught every single programming class the same way, and I loved it. He also had Wi-Fi in the room, and it was one of the few rooms that had Wi-Fi, so I could play on my computer all day. But he, since he taught every single class the same way, he didn't actually teach the programming language per se. Every single class was about programming in general and how to think about designing programs and the methodology for designing programs. And the syntax was kind of irrelevant. So you could sit in, if you went through one class, you basically sat through everything else minus syntax changes. So he taught us a lot of acronyms. Um, and a lot of people in here are probably familiar with things like dry, don't repeat yourself. But instead of saying use a class, he would teach why you should do these things. So why you should use a class, why you should put things in a function, why you should put things in a subroutine, depending on the type of language you're working on. And keeping things simple, um, he never would say stupid, and we always tried to get him to do it, but he never would. But keeping your programs simple and uncomplicated, because the more complicated system you have, the harder it is to maintain. And especially when it comes to things like security, the more complex systems, the harder it is to secure those things. And he kind of boiled everything down to input, process, and output. He actually had us made charts in the beginning of classes on how we're supposed to structure these. But the idea is every single program takes some sort of input, be it from a user, from a file, from a web service. We have to do something to it, and then we display some sort of output. It could be another file, it could be a web page, it could be a CSV file. And he taught us a whole bunch of other acronyms. Probably the best one he taught and the best general purpose one is garbage in, garbage out. It's our job as a developer to make sure that our systems don't take bad data. Because unfortunately, we cannot trust the user to play by the rules and do things the way they're supposed to be. So we can't assume that Mary in accounting is going to not put commas in numbers. That Bob in sales is always going to remember to collect an email address or always collect a phone number. We want to pretend that we're one big happy family and this is actually the only the kids on my dad's side. Who I, this was the best family picture I could find and I don't actually talk to these people. So there's probably about, this is only about a third of the amount of people that were there that day. But we like to think that everybody will play nice but not everybody does. And those are the people that we have to watch out for because either they decide that they don't want to listen to the rules or they don't want to pay attention. How many people have gotten a support ticket that says this form doesn't work? And literally that's the support ticket, this form doesn't work. And then you ask and you say, well, what was the problem? Well, it gave me an error message. Okay, what was the error message? It said their email was empty. 
Okay, well, did you fill in an email? Well, no. <laughs> we can't fix those kind of things, but we can at least stop uh, a form from going through without an email address. There's lots of people, again, like I said, that they don't do it to be mean. They just don't pay attention. And of course, there are malicious people as well who do try to actively break things in the system. So what happens if I change a drop-down choice that's not there? Um, what happens if, I think probably the best example I've ever seen was, I think it was Best Buy way back when, right after they put up an e-commerce site. You could order TVs, which was awesome. You didn't have to go into the store. You could just order it online. It would get shipped to you. The best part about it was, though, the price was part of the form. So you could change the price, and the order would go through. And you could buy a huge TV for a buck. I don't know how many of those were filled, and I never tried it, because I'm fairly certain that's fraud, and I don't recommend doing that. But even simple things like that, or you know, malicious things like that, are things that we have to watch out for. I'm going to mostly talk about contact forms today because I think that's something everybody can relate with, but really any kind of data entry, be it from a user, from a web service, um, from a file, we can't really trust. We have to go through and we have to make sure that the data that's coming in is good data and it's the kind of data that we expect. So this is the crappy contact form off of my website. I'm a freelancer. And this is basically my website because I do a lot of word of mouth stuff. So I have this form there. I want your name and your email and your phone number. And then basically I want to know are you a person of business, what you want to build, and how you want me to contact you. I'm sure all of us, and hopefully none of us have done this recently, but we have all built a form that if I leave all of this blank and hit submit that it will go through. As a business person, I don't want blank at blank with a blank phone number to come through. So I should take my due diligence to make sure that Mr. Blank is a business and wants a web app, doesn't come through at all. I want that name, I want that email address, I want that phone number. If, like I said, uh, I think it was Bob in sales, if he's collecting customer information to follow up on somebody, we want to make sure that these things are filled out properly. And what a lot of developers do is they jump straight to client-side validation. This is a, a form off of one of my client's websites. Client-side validation is awesome. I'm not saying you should never use it. Because from a user experience perspective, it's much better to get an immediate response as to why something is broken than wait for it to refresh or you know go through the full steps on the server side. So we do things like we say, this is blank, please enter your name, please enter a valid email address, please enter a valid phone number. We've been able to do this for years. Throw in jQuery validate, throw in a couple config settings, and you're all done. I think even ancient versions of Dreamweaver had a basic check for this kind of stuff. Nowadays, we get shiny things like HTML5. So we can just say, this email field is required. And yes, I should have set this to email, but this is from Drupal, and Drupal doesn't understand what email is. Um, but now in HTML5, we can say this is required. If the user doesn't enter anything, have the form automatically tell them right away. The problem is, like users, we can't trust the browser either. Ignoring things like have the user having the JavaScript turned off, which I don't know how often have happens. I've, I don't think I've ever really had that happen on any major project I've done. But what I do run into now, especially with HTML5, is stuff just doesn't work in browsers. As much as I would love it, I have to support IE8 and 9. Does anybody here not support IE? Anything less than 10? If you have to support these, you have to do extra work. You have to fall back to JavaScript. Um, I actually use uh, HTML. I do the HTML5 tags 
and I use a polyfill called web shims, which will turn all this kind of extra stuff on for you. But that's more stuff I have to maintain. So I'm moving further and further away from that keep it simple standpoint. And if I look over here on mobile, it doesn't work at all on mobile, even the brand new stuff. I thought it worked in 7, but apparently not. I was wrong on that, and that's an assumption I have to change. But even brand new flashy stuff doesn't work. Basically, Firefox and Chrome do. Safari has limited support. So even stuff like HTML5, we can't trust that it works. The only place that we can trust that it works is in the programs we design. Can anybody tell me what type of computer this is? Okay, I'll take your word for it. I have no idea. All I know is it probably doesn't run Apache. But the only way that we can enforce that data is correct is in our program. We don't have control over the user. We can't just assume they're going to work. We, can't, we don't have full access to the browser, so we can't force the browser to work. The only thing we can do is do it on our end. Every language has a different way of doing it. PHP has the filter module. Uh, it's been built in since 5.2, but it should work with 5.1. Is anybody using less than 5.3? No? Good. Last time I gave this talk, I had three people on 5.2. But even then, it works just fine. Um, the filter modules, a very simple module, it just does validation and sanitization of data. It's really easy to work with um, because there's basically seven functions. And two of those functions work the same as two other functions, they just use arrays. So instead of doing a single variable, they'll do arrays. So there's not a whole lot to work with here, but it actually does quite a bit of work for you. So filtering is really easy. They have a filter var function. You pass it a variable, and you can actually send it a list of uh, different types of filters and then options for those filters, and it will depending on the type of filter you send it, it will either validate or sanitize your data for you. So in this case, I want to make sure that 755 is an integer, because maybe I'm taking account numbers, and those should be integers. So this top one works, because 755 will cast cleanly to an integer. 755.0, though, that's technically a float, because it has a decimal point in it. So that returns false. Now, this is a little bit of a contrived example because probably you want to accept either of those, but account numbers shouldn't have a, a period in them. So I think that's probably valid. It does, it does a lot of basic filtering out of the box, so we can check to see if something's Boolean. And it's actually kind of smart. So we can say, by default, it will say true as if the thing is one, true, on, or yes. So we don't have to check for strings in the data coming in, we can have a, a select box that says yes or no, and this will filter that stuff down to, for us into a sane value. Anything else is false unless we pass it an extra flag that says we literally want false values. So then false would actually be only for zero, false, off, no, or blank. Anything else is null. So we get a little bit of extra work on that we can do. We can check emails. Has anybody ever seen the regex, the proper RFC regex for an email? Okay, Ilya has. I've seen it, I think, in two different Rich Bowen talks. It literally fills up an entire slide, top to bottom, left to right, in very, very tiny print. It will drive you insane trying to figure out what it does. Regex already arcane enough. The, the email validator is horrible. PHP, and I apologize, I did this in widescreen because I didn't know what kind of this would be. Um, but we have filter validate email. This works, I think, for 99% of the cases of emails. I think there's some weird edge cases where it doesn't work properly. But for most people, it probably would be okay. Yeah, Ilya? Okay, so... New TLDs may not validate. So I'm going to assume you bug Ilya to get that fixed. <laughs> or submit a bug and eventually it'll get fixed in PHP. Um, so for most people, this will probably work. 
We can do basic things like floats and integers like I showed. Uh, we can validate IPs. So if we've got a form where we need to take an IP address for, uh, for a server, for like maybe a support ticket, we can do IPv4 or IPv6. Um, on integers, we can even do octal and hex if we need to take those for whatever reason. We can do URLs because a lot of times we'll ask people, what's your website? Well, instead of going through and making sure that it's a properly structured URL, we can just have PHP do it for us. And if you need to fall back to regex because you love regex so much, you can use a regular expression to actually validate data. I've used that mostly with things like account numbers where we have to have one letter and like X number of uh, numbers and things like that. You can do even more complex ones, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in addition to making sure that data is valid, we can also kind of clean it up as well. So there's a series of sanitization flags that you can run with this. So I'm going to take ID 655, and I'm going to run it through the integer sanit sanitizer, and I'm going to get back just 655. This is, I believe, more intelligent than just trying to cast stuff. So if you need to clean up data, like you've got phone numbers, you want to clean out extra junk because you don't want parentheses, you don't want hyphens to, for storage, you can use this to kind of clean all that stuff out without having to mess with, you know, regular expression re uh, replaces and string replaces and stuff. It'll just kind of do it for you. We can clean up a lot more than what we can validate. So we have some kind of one-to-one -one thing. So we can clean up email addresses, get rid of things. Um, so if it's not in the normal set of characters for email addresses, we'll, we'll strip that stuff out. We have URL encoding. There are functions in PHP that will do URL encoding, but you can use this with other uh, filters to not only filter other stuff out, but then also URL encode it. So you can say, is this a URL? And by the way, I'm going to go ahead and URL encode anything that's in there as well. Magic quotes, if you're using that, you probably shouldn't. You've got other problems. Um, floats, integers, you've got special characters to turn, and then it's buddy, full special characters, to turn HTML entities into, uh, like, greater than, less than turns them into their HTML entities. String, which in theory will strip tags, you probably need to do, uh, or th this will strip tags and optionally strip in or encode special characters. So it kind of does double duty here. Sh stripping HTML tags you have to be very careful with because a lot of times if they send malformed HTML, it won't strip properly. So you need to kind of clean that stuff up beforehand. This does a pretty good job, um, but you may want to play around with it and and see how well it works for your specific situation. And we can clean up URLs. Has anybody ever used unsafe raw, which doesn't do any filtering? What was your use case for that? Oh, okay. Um, but not the other device, so okay. So in the times that the built-in filters and stuff don't work for us, we can do a callback and we can apply more complex logic. So in this case, for some odd reason, I want to chop off the first five characters of the string. So I can pass it a string, say I'm going to do a callback, and say the function's called my filter. It'll pass it in, and we'll, in this case, I'm just going to chop off the first five characters. Since you're doing whatever you want, I'm, in this case, I'm kind of running a sanitizer. I'm going to clean this data up. You can have this run a validator and return false if the data doesn't match whatever you're doing. But if you need the complex stuff, you can do it by hand. And like I said, you can also run things against arrays. So instead of having a bunch of filter var calls, you have filter var array. And you can pass it an array of data. And this does need to be. Uh, basically an associative array so it's because it's got to match the keys up. And you send it a series of definitions, and it will go through it, and it will clean up that array of data. So again, I apologize. This is probably really hard to see, but we're going to pass in an array that has a product ID, and we've actually thrown in a script tag for good measure. 
we've got a component ID, we've got the version that it is, we've got an array that's there, um, and then we have something called test array that's actually just an integer. So what filter var array will do is it will go through the array definition and match that stuff up. So product ID, we're gonna make sure that's encoded properly. So that will help us clear up that script tag that someone decided to try to throw in there. Component is actually supposed to be a list of components that a product has, so it should be an array. So first off, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that thing's an integer. So everything in there should be an integer. We're gonna force that to an array, so it's actually gonna convert 10 into a single element array with 10 in it. And then we're also gonna make sure that it's at least between one and 10. If it fails that validation, um, we should get back false, because um, validate int will fail. So we can do com kind of complex things right here. Version, we're gonna make sure that's encoded, because um, that could just be a string, but again, we don't want characters to come through. And then same thing here, we're gonna make sure this is an integer and it's a scalar, and then this is an integer, the array we're gonna force to an array. We have one key here does not exist, which doesn't exist up here. So when we run filter var array, it's actually gonna add that to our data array. And, well, it's gonna add it to the result and that will return null because it doesn't exist up here. So if you have a lot of forms that you wanna do or you have a lot of complex validation you wanna do, you can shove this kind of stuff off into a config file or things like that and pass full arrays in and not have to step through one by one. Now the filter module's okay, it's not great, it's very low level. And one thing uh, Larry talked about this morning is there's a lot of code out there that's already built. You don't need to build your own filters. And like I said, FilterVar has a lot of basic stuff, so complicated things you've gotta build on your own with it. One of the best filtering modules or libraries I found is Aura.filter. Um, from the Aura project by Paul M. Jones. I like the Aura components because they are very, very decoupled. Aura filter has one dependency and it's for Aura's installer. It has no other dependencies. If you try to pull in like uh, Zen Validator and like the Symphony stuff, they have huge dependencies that you may not want for your application. So I really like pulling an Aura. Um, it's also PSR 0, 1, and 2 compliant. So it's very clean code, it's very easy to read, and it's very easy to work with. So here's another huge block of code that no one can probably see other than me. Um, and I'm not on my Mac, so I don't think I have a way to zoom in. Oh well. The way you use Aura filter is you get a filter um, in this example that I've, I've shamelessly stolen from their uh, documentation, they have a pre-built filter that you can pull in that already sets up everything. Aura is very decoupled, so you kind of have to set some things up for yourself because they don't assume you're using any Aura stuff to begin with. So Aura filter, if I pull in their instance, it actually sets up every single filter they've got set. And then I can add rules to it. So I'm going to have rule, I'm gonna have three rules for my username. I'm gonna have two, I'm gonna have one for password and one for password confirm. And then I can basically just check to see if it works. So the rule types in filter are soft rules. And that's, again, you can't probably see it when, if you get the slides later on, you'll be able to see this a lot better. Um, everything I've done here is a soft rule. What a soft rule does is it doesn't stop the validation chain. So in the case of the username, we want to make sure it's alphanumeric, it's between six and 12 characters, and those are basically the only two rules we're going to enforce upon it. Since those are soft rules, if it's uh, not alphanumeric, we'll still, ch we'll still check the length. Because it's kind of annoying if you put special characters in a username, but it's only five, five characters long. You don't want to fix it and then get another validation error afterwards. So probably most of the things you'll do are soft rules. Hard rules will stop the validation chain for that specific element, 
but do everything else in the list. So if we change username to a hard rule for the alphanumeric, it'll never check the string length, but we'll still check the password. About the only time I use that is when I might be doing expensive operations after the fact. Like I have a custom validator that might actually validate that that is a username. If it doesn't look like a valid username, I may not make that database call. Or you can have stop rules, which just completely stop all ex execution in the validation chain, and it doesn't continue. I've never used that in a real world situation, but it's there in case you need it. The way Aura Filter works is everything is probably both a filter and a sanitizer. So in the case of alphanumeric, we can use that as a validation test, or we can use that as a sanitation test. What we do is um, decide either it's a mandatory or not mandatory. So we have rule collection is, which says it has the that data bit has to match this rule we're doing. So in the case of username, it has to be alphanumeric. If it's not, we're going to uh, throw an error, or not throw an error, but we're going to generate a message. We can say is not, so we can have the opposite of that. It mustn't match any of the uh, rules we supply. Or one thing that the filter module doesn't really do, we can say is blank or so we can say, if it's blank, allow it through. Don't run any validation tests. If it's not blank, then it has to match the validation tests. So if we have an email field that isn't required, but we would like to capture it, we can say, is blank or email. And then if they fill it in, it has to match a valid email address. If we want to sanitize something, we can say, fix it. And then Aura will call the, the sanit sanitization version of that uh, rule. And then same thing with blank. If it's not blank, then turn around and fix it. Don't just try to fix it. Aura ships with a lot more rule sets than the filter module does. So we have basic things like uh, alpha, alphanumeric, uh, integer, boolean, like filter does. But we have more complex rules, so we can validate credit card numbers. Now, validating your credit card number is not really complex, but filter doesn't, the filter module doesn't do that out of the box. Uh, better date time filtering. So if we want to make sure that we have a date and a time as opposed to just a date, we can do that. We have email. We can do, um, we can make sure that the value of an element is in an array. So you might build a select box that has five options in it. If you get an array value, if you get a value in that wasn't in that array, it'll tell you so. Now, some of these don't make sense as sanitizers. I, you're not really going to sanitize array values. You might if you want to set a default, but Aura Filter will allow you to do a lot more out of the box. And just like the filter module, we can build our own filter stuff. And there's Paul. So if you have any questions, talk to him. <laughs> yeah, because this is the end of this section. So good job, Paul. Um, and if I have said anything wrong, he won't find out till the video comes out. So uh, if you want to make your own rule, you can just extend their abstract rule class that they've got, implement, validate, and sanitize, throw your own logic in there, do whatever you need to do, and then add it to the rule locator. Um, one thing that is not in their example code is this require path up here actually generates a uh, filter for you. If you do it yourself, you actually have to set up a rule locator. They, in the documentation, they show you how to do that. And if you look at their example script, it's incredibly easy to read. It's, it's not hard. Um, but you, in this case, they've generated a, a function or a, a rule called hex, and they'll just pass that in, and now hex is available. So you can write your own complex scripts just like the filter module. Now, Aura is great, and I'm not just saying that because Paul's here, but if you're already using a framework, 
look at what your framework already provides. All of the major frameworks should have something already. And if you're using Zen Framework, look at Zen Validator. It runs mostly the same way Aura does, at, at least in theory. So you can pull up a single validator and validate it kind of like the filter module. So in this case, we're going to validate an email address. And if it's valid, we can, do, we can continue on. Or if not, we can get error messages back. That's one thing I didn't mention with the filter module. Filter module doesn't give you any sane messages. You have to deal with failures yourself. Aura and Zend and most of the library ones will give you a sane message on failure that you can pass back. You can also customize them. But Zend validator is really easy. It basically is valid. Go from there. If you need to chain them together, kind of like we did in Aura, you can make a validator chain and just attach them to the validator chain. And it will go through and it will validate everything for you. I do a lot of Symphony 2 work. So I love Symphony 2's validation scheme, mostly because it uses annotations. And annotations are the kind of magic that I absolutely love. So you can actually do this anyway. That you can do it in YAML, XML, or PHP in addition to annotations. Um, but in the case of annotations, we'll pull in their validator library. And we'll just say, this name is not blank. And then we can run it through their validation service, which is already set up in Symphony 2. And it will tell us whether or not it was valid. And again, more code nobody can read. If you use the forms, which I think is probably the most, uh, the library I use most outside of Symphony 2 in and of itself, the forms will do validation as well. I also, I, Symphony 2 forms will also generate an HTML5 form for you. So if you say, I've got a bunch of this stuff turned off on required, but if you say, uh, if you don't tell it that required is false when it generates the form, it will actually put the required HTML5 tag in there. If you tell it it's an email, it will set that as an email type so that the form can go ahead and do your client side validation for you. And then it will take care of the server side validation for you on the back end too with one set of one set of code. And it will do things like I've got years set here, which is a date time, so it'll validate that and make sure it, it matches up. Um, we've got choices down here. So in this case, it's a, an admin back end that we've got. So you can either type, you can either check for signatures that came from a manual, like a, actually someone actually physically typed it in, or we captured it from Facebook. If if it's a case where the, uh, the client didn't pay for Facebook on that specific uh, form, we could actually lock that out. And if the form gets the Facebook type to come through, this validation will fail. So Symphony 2 forms are smart enough in and of themselves to go ahead and do that as well, uh, to go ahead and take care of the validation as well. Zen Framework 2. Um, I don't know if they've changed it, but at least the way I do it is the validation doesn't go in the form. It goes on the object itself. It's the same idea. You set up a list of rules, and it will, uh, the form will pull those rules in based on the entity type. But it kind of boils down to if you're using a framework, always look first to see what your, val your, your framework is using. Um, My final note would be validation is hard, especially for the more complex rules. Look to see what other people have built and use those other libraries as much as possible. If you can get away with the filter module, that is awesome. Use it, uh, especially if you've got really tiny scripts. If you don't, pull in something small like Aura, the Aura filter. Use that if you're using a framework. Use what they've, they've done. Validation is kind of like cryptography. There are much smarter people than you or I who have built these things. Use them. They're out there. There's really no reason that you don't have to use them. And I've apparently sped through this talk. So does anybody have any questions? No? Anybody? Paul. Oh. Uh, 
Um, if you're using the filter module, I would probably use the callback, uh, the filter callback, and then have that go through and contact your database and then return a yes or no on that. Or a filter, I would probably just write a custom filter for that. Same thing for Zen Framework and Symfony. Um, I'd write a custom validator, a custom constraint for those and have them go out. How you set those up probably depends on your application. So like Symfony, you can do a lot of uh, dependency injection in the config to pull that kind of stuff in. Um, so you kind of play around with it, but it's probably going to be custom validation no matter what system you use. So the question was, what, what do I think about the way Zen Framework 2 does the validation on the model? I think from a, an architectural standpoint, it makes much more sense because my model should be the one validating whether or not it's correct, not passing everything off to the form. I think the form should use it, but that shouldn't be the canonical resource for whether or not another object is valid. Um, like I showed, you can do direct stuff on Symfony 2. But most of the time you're probably using it with a form and they kind of assume you're doing it with a form. You, you, Cause you have to manually look to see it. The doctrine stuff will fire automatically when you're saving, but otherwise you have to manually call the validator unless you're using a form. I would probably say most people are probably using a form. I think it should be on the entity itself though. Cause it makes more sense. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, the validation should go with whoever actually should own the validation. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. Well, everybody should have plenty of time to get to their next session. I apologize for it being so short, but. Um, okay, go ahead. It depends on how much external data you're working with. I usually only do filtering when I can't trust, uh, then when my system does not generate the data. So if I'm doing, uh, like I do a lot of data entry applications for, for businesses, that can be a huge undertaking because you have to find every single place that you're bringing stuff in. So it, it's probably worthwhile to say like, okay, where's all my post variables at? Finding that, if I've got a huge list of those, it's probably gonna be a long time to do. Um, and I would probably pull an aura because it's, I can get much more business logic out of it. It's hard to estimate those kind of things because it really depends on the complexity of the application. It's not an easy job. It's a boring, boring job. Um, that's an awesome time to put in tests and do it then, especially if you use the libraries like aura and stuff like that. You can build your validations, put tests on them, and make sure that those validators don't fail later on down the road because you made a change to them or whatever. Um, anybody else? No? Okay. Um, please rate this talk on Joined In, even if you hated it. I'd rather get a bunch of ones so I know never to give this talk again. Um, so please go on not only my talk, but rate any talk you've seen at Sunshine PHP. If you have any questions, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Dragon Man Tank. Or you can email me. Chris at ctankersley.com. Um, I will be here the rest of the day until like 10 o'clock tomorrow because my plane won't leave till then. So if you have any questions, come up and see me afterwards or download these slides. I'm going to upload them in a few minutes here. Assuming speaker deck works, or a speaker deck or slide share, depending on which, if they both fail or not, I'll link these on the joined in talk so you can download them as soon as they're done being processed. So thank you very much.